Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. My name is Karen Bernaska, and I am the Water Projects Coordinator at Save the Sound. On behalf of the Nature Conservancy, Rivers Alliance, Connecticut River Conservancy, Clean Water Action, the Connecticut League of Conservation Voters, Citizens Campaign for the Environment, Save the Sound, and 16 supporting organizations, welcome to this year's World Water Day event. Before we begin, I'd like you all to know that this uh, event is being recorded. Auto-generated captions will come up. And if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section and we'll try to go through them through the course of this program. This year's World Water Day theme is groundwater, making the invisible visible. Over the next hour, you will hear about the importance of groundwater to everyone and how and what we can do to protect this precious resource for future generations. In addition to celebrating World Water Day, the official UN World Water Day is tomorrow, but we are celebrating it today and we'll celebrate it again tomorrow. But in addition to celebrating World Water Day, we are recognizing and celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Federal Clean Water Act. And we will hear more about that shortly. But to begin this program, it is my pleasure to introduce the governor of the state of Connecticut, the Honorable Ned Lamont. Thank you for celebrating World Water Day. Do not take this for granted. We're looking at the pictures around the globe. We see how climate change is impacting rain and flooding and dry and arid and forest fires. Don't take this for granted. Look, Saudi Arabia has oil. Connecticut has water. We are an amazing aquifer. We have 5,800 miles of uh, rivers. We have uh, enormous streams, fresh water. Don't take it for granted. Thank you for everything you're doing. Well, my thanks to Governor Lamont for his opening remarks. And now we're gonna to go to a person directly involved with all water issues in Connecticut, the chair of the state's Water Planning Council, Mr. Jack Betkoski. Good afternoon. I'm once again honored to be part of World Water Day. Thank you to all the wonderful organizations for sponsoring this event and for your efforts assisting in the development and implementation of our Connecticut water supply plan. This year's theme, groundwater, making the invisible visible, is something the State Water Planning Council takes very seriously. My colleagues on the council, Lori Matthew from the Department of Public Health, Martin Heth from the Office of Policy Management, and Graham Stevens from DEEP are thoroughly aware of the challenges that we face as advocates for a clean, potable water supply in the state of Connecticut. Protecting our groundwater supply is an integral part of the state water plan. Groundwater is an important source for our drinking water and stream flow. The protection of our groundwater supply is important to everyone in our state. Most of our groundwater supply is clean. However, because of human neglect, carelessness, and accidents, the supply is vulnerable and at risk. Climate change will add stress to our natural and management systems, and PFAS has already caused significant public health and economic challenges in the state of Connecticut. The state water plan reaffirms the state's dedication to the highest Class A standard of drinking water quality in the United States. In the United States, we use approximately 322 billion gallons, that's 322 billion gallons of water per day. The three largest users are irrigation, thermoelectric power, and public supply. I believe these statistics validate the importance of sustaining a potable public water supply. The Water Planning Council is fortunate to have a group of dedicated volunteers on our advisory and implementation work group who assist in prioritizing the goals and objectives of the state water plan. On behalf of the Water Planning Council, I thank them for their dedication and passion to water issues in the state of Connecticut. It has been said many times that water is the gold of the future. It is my sincere hope that moving forward, we treat it like gold. Let us all work together to protect it, conserve it, and not take it for granted. I look forward to the panel discussion this afternoon. Thanks very much. 
My thanks to Jack Betkoski for that great introduction. As I mentioned earlier, we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act. And to give you some background and history on the Federal Clean Water Act, I'd like to turn the floor over to Holly Drinketh, the Dr Director of Outreach and Watershed Projects at the Nature Conservancy. Holly. Thanks, Karen. And thank you all for joining us today for our online World Water Day celebration. As Karen mentioned, we are celebrating and acknowledging today the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act, uh, which was established 50 years ago in 1972. In his remarks, Governor Lamont showed us just how abundant Connecticut's uh, water resources are, reminding us, us that places from Bigelow Hollow and Candlewood Lake to the Connecticut River and Long Island Sound are valued uh, by people and wildlife in Connecticut for the groundwater from the groundwater resources and wetlands to our waterways, we do depend on these waters for drinking water, transportation, and amazing recreational opportunities like fishing, boating, and swimming. But for some of us, uh, it may be hard to imagine that things were very different five decades ago. Since the beginning of the industrial age here in Connecticut in the late 1700s, Rivers powered mills, uh, mill wheels and turbines for hundreds of textile mills, arms factories, grist mills and uh, sawmills. But, and as manufacturing grew across our state, more people were concentrated in our cities. And we all began to rely on the rivers to carry away some of the waste, the chemicals from manufacturing and dyes from textile mills, as well as human waste taking that away from our communities and out to sea. By the 1960s and 70s, it wasn't unusual for Connecticut's rivers downstream of our textile mills to run red, green, or orange. And mercury and other heavy metals settled out of the industrial practices that we used into our waterways. They can become trapped behind dams and in mill ponds and waterways. Uh, and at the same time, inadequate sewage treatment made, it, uh, made some of our rivers and beaches unsafe for fishing and swimming, or could lead to algae blooms that used up oxygen in the water and harmed aquatic life. In 1969, this all came to a head when spark, sparks ignited oil and gasoline in Cleveland's Cuyahoga River. That fire caused public outcry over pollution levels in our nation's waterways. And Congress then adopted a revolutionary new federal law. It's implemented through the state and local governments, and it helps us to set limits on pollution discharged into waterways. The Clean Water Act also establishes penalties for violating the law and endangering public health. The passage of the Clean Water Act in 1972 set precedents for cleaning up our waterways to ensure they're healthy for people to enjoy and can provide safe drinking water to all Americans. In 2000, here in Connecticut, the Connecticut Department of Environmental Protection and EPA used the Clean Water Act to establish nitrogen pollution limits at sewage treatment plants. More recently, we've also used the Clean Water Act to establish guidelines for stormwater management that help slow down and capture polluted runoff before it can enter the water. We've made a lot of great progress. Today, Connecticut's waterways, including Long Island Sound, are healthier for fish and wildlife and safer for swimming than they were 50 years ago. But there is still much more work to be done to ensure all communities have access to clean, healthy, and safe water now and in the future. New threats from warming temperatures in the water and in the air, changing precipitation patterns, as well as emerging toxic chemicals, require investments in science and infrastructure, including in our nature-based stormwater management and increasing protection of wetlands, streams, and healthy forests. Creating better systems for accountability and transparency can help, keep in, help us ensure that our groundwater, rivers, and Long Island Sound continue to see improvements and stay clean and healthy for generations to come. So thanks for spending a little time to celebrate and reflect on the importance of the Clean Water Act and help us celebrate the, the past five decades. Here's to even more improvement and protection in the next 50 years. 
Now I'm very pleased to introduce Virginia DeLima. Virginia is a hydrologist who spent 33 years working for the US Geological Survey. I first met her when she served as the director of the Connecticut Water Science Center for the agency. Since she retired in 2014, she remains involved with water issues in Connecticut as a member of the Water Planning Council's advisory committee. Uh, I've always admired Virginia's ability to make information about water resources more accessible. And I recently learned she had a prior career teaching second grade and junior high math and science. And I'm certain that's why she's such a great presenter. And I hope that you enjoy this presentation. Thanks, Virginia. Hello, everybody. We're going to be talking about groundwater. So let's take a look at groundwater. If you try to do that, I'm sure that this is what you'll see. So the intent today is to make that invisible visible. Now we're going to be looking at a lot of what we call cross sections. And just so that you understand the perspective here, think of a layer cake. And the Earth's layers are being exposed in that diagram just as they would be in a layer cake. You might remember back from junior high that you had the hydrologic cycle, the water cycle. Water evaporated from the oceans, condensed into clouds, and returned to the Earth as precipitation, either as rain or snow. And then it went across the surface of the Earth back to the ocean. So let's focus on that aspect, what we see flowing in streams. This is a picture of the Fenton River. Take a good look at that. We'll be coming back to this. But let's take a look at this again. Some of that precipitation seeps into the ground, infiltrates, percolates into the ground, and then moves through the ground as groundwater and discharges back to a surface water body, a lake, an ocean. So do we, does that happen in rivers? Are there underground streams or lakes? No, they're not. Not here. That only happens in areas in, such as in Kentucky where you would find caves. But let's look at what actually happens around here. The precipitation percolates through the ground and gets down into the loose sediments. If we look here, we can see bits of water in the open places, the poor places between these grains of sand. And it's the level below which all the pores are filled with water that we call the water table. Above that, there's a little bit of water, but it's not saturated. And it's this area, the unsaturated area, that trees use to get their, their water. So let's look at a typical New England Valley. We have bedrock underlying everything. And bedrock is not usually seen except when we have road cuts. We've all seen these things as we drive down the highway. And you'll notice that there are some cracks, some fractures in this rock. And so we think of rock as being solid. Yet, you've all also seen something like this. Clearly, water can move through those fractures in the, in the rock. If you live in a rural area, most likely you have your own well. It's typically an eight inch steel pipe sticking above the ground and it's drilled into the rock. So if we drilled a well here and it intersected this fracture and that fracture had water in it, that well would get water. If we drilled another well, a deeper one, it would, might intersect the same fracture and get water. Also, we could drill a well here it's not intersecting any of those cracks and that well would be dry. So let's go back to looking at our typical New England Valley and talk for a moment about glaciers. We have unconsolidated sediments, loose sediments on the uplands and also in the bottom of the valley. These were all deposited by glaciers. If we think of a glacier as a big old ice snowplow, it pushes the ground around and it also crunches some of the material under it. So these are pictures of modern day glaciers. If you look at this, it's got all sorts of sediment, just a jumble mixture of stuff on top of it. If this were to melt, all these particles would fall together with the little grains plugging up the holes between the big grains. That's what we typically call till. And that's very common in the upland areas. If that glacier melts and the material is carried by the flowing water, the water 
sorts it into different sized particles. And when that water enters a lake, the heavy particles fall out first as it slows down, and then the lighter particles move out further. These are where we get the stratified deposits that are typical in the central part of our valleys. So if you take nothing else from today, I want you to know that water is a single resource. It's a single shared resource. Let's look at a cross section of what we have. Again, the precipitation falls on the ground, it seeps into the ground and flows to a river. Have you ever wondered why a stream keeps flowing even if it hasn't rained for a while? Well, what's happening is that water is discharging from the ground. It always goes from high to low, and you can see the level here is higher than in the stream, so it's gonna to flow to the stream. And if we look at a graph of stream flow, you have all these peaks that are representing rain events, but you've got this constant amount of flow that's happening. That's the component that's coming from the groundwater discharging into that stream. So let's look at this again. What can prevent the groundwater from flowing to that stream? If we put a well in there and the well is pumping, this water is going to go into the well. It's going to not have the effect of discharging to the stream, and so it's going to lower that discharge. If we keep on pumping, we might even be drawing water from the stream into the well. Note here that the water level in the stream is higher than the water level in the well, so it induces this water, induced infiltration to the well. Again, it's lowering stream flow. Often wells are very close to streams. This happens to be one in Massachusetts, but it happens in Connecticut as well. And if that well is pumping, you can actually cause the stream to go dry, both from the intercepted groundwater discharge to the stream, as well as that induced infiltration sucking water out of the stream. You probably all remember the Fenton River in 2005. So again, what else can prevent water from getting to the, the groundwater from discharging to the stream? Well, pavement, and we have a lot of urban areas here. The water cannot seep into the ground. It gets shunted into storm sewers and then dumps directly into streams. So it missed going through the groundwater. As you can see from this picture, there's also an issue with, potential issue with groundwater quality. So let's spend a moment looking at water quality. We typically think of the problems as being big issues, what we call point sources, sewage treatment plants, landfills, whatever, something that happens at a particular location. But land use in general can also affect water quality. These cows obviously are gonna have an effect on this stream, but you could also have a pasture where the effect is seeping into the groundwater and therefore contaminating the groundwater. Similarly, you could have toxic material in these bar uh, barrels. When the snow melts, it could go into a stream or it could seep into the groundwater in a similar way. So here we have our same picture with contamination here going flowing with the groundwater and potentially getting to the well. You'll notice that it's not immediately next to the well. So the various regulations that protect areas within a certain uh, radius around a well may not necessarily be protective of the water quality in that well. Land use, as I said, affects water quality. And often, again, we think of the large industrial land uses. These are non-point sources. They're more generally widespread. It's not necessarily always the big guys. It could be your own backyard. The perspective here might not be clear at first. This is the railing of stairs going down to the backyard. And you'll notice this area where the snow has melted. That's the area over the septic system. And sometimes septic systems fail. These kids are playing in a puddle and notice how lush this grass is here. That's a failed septic system. So these, this kind of contamination can happen over large widespread areas. This is an ad right off the internet for a, a lawn fertilizer. It has the before and the after. And so the nutrients that come from fertilizer are widespread and can seep into the groundwater. There are other backyards that maybe haven't used that treatment yet, but let's not focus on that. So let's go back to our water cycle and contaminants can come from any place in here. It can come from contamination on the ground, in the water, even in the air. You may remember a lot of talk about acid rain. So it can come from any place 
in this cycle. So groundwater, as I said, is a single shared resource. We have to protect all, com not all components of it because not only there's the quantity issue, but there's also a quality issue. And now I'd like to introduce Alicia Sharmut, who, will, who is the executive director of Rivers Alliance and will be moderating our panel. Thank you, Virginia. Um, and this was really a, a great way to uh, bring us into um, our panel discussion. That was some really great um, uh, Groundwater 101 information. Thanks again, Virginia. Um, Again, I will be moderating our panel today. Um, and just to let you know that um, any questions you have, you can put in the question and answer box. Um, and if we have time at the end, um, we'll try to answer some of those questions. If we don't have time, um, we'll try to save those questions and the host organizations can get back to you um, and answer those. Um, so I'm going to introduce our, our panelists and I invite um, our panelists to uh, go ahead and turn their cameras on um, so we can see all of you. Um, I'm gonna in, uh, introduce them one by one and give them each a question and then we'll go through a few rounds of questions after that. So um, our first panelist um, is Melissa Mustawi. She is currently a natural resource specialist uh, with the Southwest Conservation District. She holds degrees in Earth and Environmental Science from Central Connecticut State University and Wesleyan University while earning her master's degree at Wesleyan. Uh, she, uh, she interned with the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection as a GIS analyst. Um, she began her professional career as a field hydrogeologist at Fuston O'Neill in the remediation department. And because she isn't already doing a whole lot. <laughs> she serves on the board of directors of the Geological Society of Connecticut, as well as the steering turn, uh, team of the West River Watershed Coalition. Welcome, Melissa, and I'm so glad you could join us today. Um, so my first question to you, um, what led you be to become a hydrogeologist and how do you view your role in managing and protecting groundwater? So I didn't plan to work in any field related to hydrogeology when I first started college, but I owe where I am today to the people I met along the way through my academic and professional career. I started out at Central as a history major because I was intimidated by math and science at the time, and a science class was required to complete my curriculum, so I decided to take an introduction to meteorology. And that class really opened my mind to a broader perspective of how the world operates. And I loved it. And after that course, I changed my major to geoscience and was on track to become a high school science teacher. But the semester before graduation, I took a course abroad to study geohazards in Taiwan. And that really inspired me to want to pursue research and attend graduate school. So after walking at graduation, I received my degree and my certification to teach, but I actually came back for a fifth year to gain some research experience and boost my grad school application. And following that year, I was accepted at Wesleyan University to study paleoclimate and sedimentology. So towards the end of grad school, I was ahead of my research, ready to defend my thesis and interning at the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. So I was really starting to think about my next steps for my career. And like two days after that thought, one of my friends from undergrad actually texted me saying that there was an opening at Fuss and O'Neill for a field hydrogeology position. And maybe a month after that text, I was offered the job and that's how I began my career as a field hydrogeologist. And at Fuss and O'Neill, I literally got my hands dirty and feet wet while sampling groundwater and the soil all across the state. And I really enjoyed the work because it was physically demanding and it was mostly outside. And it was also in places I never thought I'd step foot in. And I really learned a lot about the industrial history of Connecticut. And after a few years at Fuss and O'Neill, I decided I wanted to rekindle my love for education and combine my scientific background. And that's how I found my way to the Southwest Conservation District, where we help landowners, developers, watershed stakeholders, 
uh, and government staff to help make informed decisions about soil and water conservation to protect the watershed that they live in. And we do this by providing technical recommendations, by compiling information from literature, regulatory review, field observations, uh, GIS map analyses. And given what we do at the Conservation District, I think it's important that people should know that groundwater is indeed an important invisible resource that needs to be protected, especially at the source and their actions and land use choices affect the quality and quantity and the supply of groundwater now in the future. Thank you, Melissa. And you've had quite a journey. You're so young and I hope everybody appreciates the, the what goes into to the work that yourself and a lot of others do on the ground. Um, next, um, I wanna introduce um, Sharon Lewis. Sharon is the executive director of the Coalition for Environmental Justice, which prom promotes environmental just justice throughout com through community advocacy and engagement. She was exposed to advocacy at an early age um, and worked for Corporate America in the reinsurance and industry and the reinsurance and insurance industry for 17 years, where she traveled extensively. Um, it was her dealings with the Love Canal situation that gave rise to her feelings for a lack of, of environmental justice in low-income communities of color. Currently, she serves as on the board of directors of Rivers Alliance, and as well as several environmental and health com committees convened by the state of Connecticut. Welcome, Sharon. I'm so glad you're with us. Um, so what stands out for you? related to the importance of groundwater in communities you've worked here in Connecticut and around the nation. You're on mute, Sharon. Sorry about that. If I may quote someone that we all know, uh, Martha Stewart, groundwater is a good thing. Millions of people in America get their drinking water from uh, public water systems that use groundwater. People drink the water, they bathe in it, they cook with it, they use it to grow our food, uh, irrigate our crops with it. It sustains life. Um, but unfortunately, uh, due to the uh, uh, anthropogenic uh, influences of our industrial past present, not all communities have access to clean, healthy and safe water. Uh, some communities based upon where they live, work, play and go to school, uh, which is near facilities or industries that pollute the water uh, with uh, life altering contaminants are disproportionately exposed to unsafe and, and unhealthy water. Uh, Flint, Michigan is just one example of what happens when thousands of people who rely upon public water systems that have been contaminated uh, affect their health and well being. Um, access to Clean water is a civil right, and it is also a major environmental injustice if one does not have access to safe, healthy, and clean water. Thank you, Sharon. And, and water is a public trust resource that should be held in trust for everyone in, in, in our communities and society. So thank you for the work that you do, and I will introduce our last panelist and I'll come back to you again, Sharon. Um, so our last uh, panelist that is to be introduced is Bill Lucy. Uh, he is the Long Island Sound Keeper for uh, Save the Sound. He protects water quality and the fish and wildlife of Long Island Sound to be benefit both people and the sound itself. Raised in Wilton here in Connecticut, um, he grew up exploring and fishing Long Island Sound before attending the University of Vermont. He then went on to serve in the Peace Corps in Guatemala and then lived in Alaska for 20 years where he worked as a federal biologist, commercial salmon and halibut fisherman, as well as a municipal biologist and coastal planner. Um, prior to his return to Connecticut, he was the project manager for the Kauai Invasive Species Committee with the University of Hawaii. Uh, welcome, Bill. And um, I'm gonna bring this down uh, uh, back to the Clean Water Act briefly, uh, based on your, your uh, experience. Um, so this year, again, as we mentioned, is the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act. 
Um, I think most folks would be really, really surprised to know that there really hasn't been a strong link between groundwater and the Clean Water Act until most recently. Um, can you tell us about that linkage and why it's such a big deal? Sure, thanks, Alicia. <clears throat> so discharge wasn't part of the Clean Water Act because there is a certain filtering process that can take place when water goes through the soil or the sand in certain situations. You know, if we put in a rain garden or a bioswale, that's the intent. And especially during the warm months, the plants will be able to filter out some of the nutrients and pollutants. Um, but that's not always the case. And what changed happened in 2020 with the Supreme Court case, the county of Maui versus the Hawaii Wildlife Fund. And there's a lot of pollution issues in Hawaii having lived there for three years. And what was going on was the coral reefs were dying in a certain bay and investigators and monitors were able to link the pollution that was killing that coral directly to a county owned municipal sewage treatment plant. So they were able to backtrack that and they made the argument that said, look, you're discharging to the ocean. You need to have a national pollution discharge elimination system permit. We call them NIPTES permits. And it's the permit all our wastewater treatment plants have to have, whether they're discharging into the Connecticut River or directly in the Long Island Sound. And the reason you have those is so you put limits on what can go out of those plants. So you wanna make them as efficient and as clean as possible. And in, in Connecticut, our plants do fairly well. Connecticut Deep's done a great job of driving down the nitrogen inputs from these sewage treatment plants. Um, we, we average about four milligrams per liter and that's very good, that's low. Um, now, <clears throat> groups like ours, Save the Sound, we, we monitor water pollution. So, and we do this under the Clean Water Act and within the Clean Water Act, there's a citizen provision. And what that means is any citizen of this country has the right, as Sharon put, civil right really to defend clean water. Um, and the, the Clean Water Act is now 50 years old. And those of us who remember when we were kids back in the 70s, before that act really got going, how, how fairly dirty Long Island Sound and the rivers were, it was bad. And so through the actions of regulators as well as regular citizens, we've been able to clean that up. So that's the big, point to bring home with this Maui case is now that if you discharge into the ground and you pollute something where that groundwater comes out back to surface water, you have to be permitted and you're held liable. Thanks, Bill. And the next question is to you as well. Um, I love the phrase, what falls on the ground ends up in the sound. But what about what's yes. under the ground? Does groundwater matter to the health of the Long Island Sounds? Absolutely. So all the groundwater in our watershed, whether it's New York or Connecticut, that's within the surface watersheds of Long Island Sound, the groundwater typically go in that same direction. And a lot of what is being carried by that groundwater is pollution, nutrient pollution to be specific. So what happens when, let's say, nitrogen, excess nitrogen gets into Long Island Sound and it comes into the over 100 bays and harbors, those enclosed areas that we mostly interact with, um, they don't flush as well. That, that nitrogen gets pooled up in there, it creates these algae blooms, seaweed, plankton blooms. You just get, it's like throwing fertilizer on your tomato plant. You get lots of growth. And then when that growth dies, it settles down to the bottom. And then all the little critters that are in the soils, the benthic and the, on the bottom start consuming it. And they use oxygen to consume that material and turn it into energy. And then furthermore, while they're doing that, they reduce the oxygen. And when the oxygen's gone, there's a whole nother layer of benthic critters that can use things other than oxygen to get the food out of the rotting mass. And they produce hydrogen sulfide, which is toxic. That's sometimes you'll see the bubbles come up and it smells like rotten egg. That can get into uh, eelgrass and other things. And it's very, very toxic to life. So 
what you really want to do is make sure that you're not getting those toxins into Long Island Sound in the first place. And one thing that is going on is mapping out the groundwater and where this stuff is coming in. Now we learned a little bit about glacial geology out on Long Island, there's a lot of sand out there. So because it's the end of the glacial moraine, a lot of that was sorted. So there's one aquifer under Long Island itself and that water is where everyone gets their drinking water. It's also where all their septic tanks discharge. So they're discharging septic leachate into the same aquifer that they're getting their drinking water from. So they've been very cautious because nitrates are, they cause cancer. And so they're mapping it all out. And one interesting thing to notice about that is in the center of the island, a lot of that nitrogen was probably back, occurred back in the colonial times. So if you had a cattle farm in the middle of the, of the island, some of that nitrogen just getting in the Long Island Sound now a couple of hundred years later. So it shows how intense the, the uh, contamination can be. Now on the Connecticut side, USGS uh, has been doing some work and they're starting to get a handle on how fast nitrogen pollution from our activities is going through groundwater to surface waters. And it seems to be a lot quicker, probably because of the bedrock controls that we learned about earlier. So yeah, everything that falls on the land, whether it's rain or a discharge or you dump something, ends up either in groundwater right away or surface waters and all, all eventually go to Long Island Sound. Thanks, Phil. Um, my next question is to you, Sharon. Um, your organization has spearheaded many efforts to protect communities from various sources of pollution. What do you see as the biggest threats to groundwater in, in vulnerable communities? Well, there's several threats, but uh, I'll talk about two. Uh, the biggest threat to me is illegal disposal of hazardous wastes. And the right after that comes contamination in general. Uh, there are countless sources of contaminants in groundwater that adversely impact uh, EJ communities. But let me just start again with the illegal disposal of hazardous waste, because that becomes a dangerous unknown. You know, the environmental justice movement was founded in 1982 as a result of protests stemming from the illegal dumping of PCBs in a rural, largely low-income African-American community in Warren County, North Carolina. That situation set the stage for several studies which revealed that the majority of the hazardous waste facilities in the United States were located in communities of color. Fast forward, we now know that there are, as I mentioned, countless sources of contaminants and the groundwater. EJ communities are replete with pesticides, industrial chemicals, air pollution, which produces acid rain, wastewater treatment plants, which re-release untreated waste sometimes, regional landfills, incinerators, stormwater runoff, coal-fired power plants. Let me just give you an idea of what a typical environmental justice community looks like. It looks like this. You have junkyards, gas stations, vehicle repair shops, storage tanks above and below ground, manufacturing facilities, dry cleaners, print shops, auto body shops. Of course, you have the highways running through these communities. There are transportation hubs. Um, and as I mentioned, incinerators and landfills, but also many, many Superfund sites and brownfields. I'm very concerned about this. And let me give you an example of what happened in Hartford. I live very close to the North Hartford landfill. And prior to its closing, we had to deal with the transportation of the waste that leaked from the trucks on the way to the landfill. And uh, the route to the landfill was often through our neighborhood. So the trucks leaked on the route to the landfill. And then we had an issue with the birds. My backyard had so many black birds in it. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Alfred Hitchcock movie, The Birds. I was often afraid to go outside and my little dogs were always terrorized by the birds who uh, picked up the trash from the landfill, but then brought it to a different location, meaning our neighborhood, carrying with them whatever they picked up and dropped it in our backyards. So, um, you know, an EJ community is not the best place for uh, clean and um, um, land. And also, you know, you have to think about fracking. 
fracking using high pressured water to uh, search for oil and gas, you know, that contaminated groundwater. And I've been reading a lot about microplastics and how they affect groundwater and don't even get into the waterborne chemicals uh, such as lead and mercury, which has wreaked havoc for decades on the wealth, on the health and well being of uh, EJ communities. So I just can't say one, there are several things because um, EJ communities are disproportionately impacted uh, due to all these exposures uh, based upon where they live. They live very close to all these pollution sources. In addition to that, there is a lack of cleanup and enforcement actions. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Sharon. I um and, and PFAS coming from those landfills is also uh, a major. Yeah, um and um I think with that I'm going to uh, transition over to Melissa, understanding all of the challenges um, from the sources that that Sharon just mentioned. Um, the Southwest Conservation District encompasses a broad swath of communities from really low density communities like Oxford to Connecticut's most populous city, which is Bridgeport. Um, do the challenges for quality and quantity of groundwater differ based on land use, hyd hydrology, geology, or all of the above? Um, I mean, of course, it's all the above. Um, hydrology and geology are pretty much fixed variables when it comes to this, but land use as it applies to certain hydrologic or geologic conditions is what we focus on to help conserve the quantity and quality of groundwater. And yeah, Southwest Connecticut is really diverse in that we can't pick and choose our strengths in land use recommendations because we have to deal with both very urban and very rural areas. But in either case, the main challenge is to protect the source water that supplies drinking water reservoirs. And the scale of protection is different between rural and urban areas due to geographic constraints and land use. So like a typical scenario for a rural area where source water serves a very local level, like an individual groundwater well, we work directly with the landowner to understand the erosion control measures that they can consider to help reduce the runoff that may leave their property and enter a local groundwater system. And this is different for an urban environment because the water is sourced from a large reservoir that feeds a municipal system. So for example, the trap rock ridges that run north to south along the Connecticut River Valley are really important for drinking water in populous areas because these ridges are usually dedicated parks um, they're undeveloped and they allow precipitation to flow through the forested land, through the ridge itself and into a reservoir at the bottom. And these reservoirs are typically owned by water companies to help preserve the area around it. And land use challenges and groundwater protection here is at a much larger scale because of the size and the amount of people they serve. And projects that focus on these large scale water sources are addressed in watershed management plans, which is why we spend a lot of time working with stakeholders at different watershed groups to help make these projects happen. And Melissa, as someone who's worked on both sides, remediation and protection, um, what do you think we can do better to protect groundwater? Um, I mean, we can continue to educate ourselves and help others raise awareness about how our actions affect the um, watershed entirely. And I also think it's important to appreciate what's being done to clean up this legacy contamination and use that as an inspiration to make sure we never get to that point ever again by focusing on the source water protection, both at a large and small scale. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we also want to ensure that there's sustained knowledge of water resources, land use, and geology to support decision makers who work for the state or with the state when it comes to the future of groundwater protection. And I do stress geology and land use because it is very important to understand the medium that the water flows through in order to fully address the changes in quality and quantity of groundwater in different scenarios. Um, thanks, Melissa, for that. And now back to Sharon. 
Sharon, what would you say are the steps that need to be taken to protect groundwater in vulnerable communities from contamination? Well, there are several steps. Please forgive me, I'm getting hoarse again. Well, um, <clears throat> number one is holding polluters accountable to clean up the contamination, timely enforcement action, and basically just to prioritize enforcement and cleanup in environmental justice communities. Um, we're trying to get a very strong environmental justice law passed in Connecticut that would help us deal with the cumulative effects of uh, the exposures that people who live in these communities uh, live with on a daily basis. And it's, it's a very significant thing to do because uh, people in EJ communities are exposed to all types of, of contaminants that um, leak into the groundwater. And um, they, we live with significant non-compliance issues that contribute to poor water quality. So um, eliminating the exposure in the first place would be a first step. Thanks, Sharon. And I've always, I've always had a mantra of, you know, the urban environment is an environment. I think for much too long we've been we've been looking at the urban environment and almost writing it off. And I think also changing that mindset that it's 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 an environment worth preserving as well because it, we're going to need all the resources we can get going forward with climate change. So thank you for the work that you do in in preserving that. Um, Bill, from a policy perspective. Um, if you had to pick one thing that needed to change um, in our management of groundwater to meet the needs of our communities and nature itself going forward, what would it be? Ah, uh, thank you. Yeah, one, uh, like Sharon said, there is so much that needs to be done. Um, I mean, essentially the goal is we need to stop putting this stuff in the groundwater in the first place. And that's from nutrients, road salts, and all the different toxins, uh, lead, mercury, the uh, PFAS. My, my son is in, I, I'm in killing work now and their wells, the elementary school wells are contaminated with PFAS. So they've been on drinking water. They're also contaminated with lead. Um, and they just got on the water uh, a couple of years ago. So when he was in kindergarten, he was exposed to that. So um, we got to stop poisoning our, our water. And I guess one policy that we should do, and I notice it in the chat, um, is we need to put some kind of law to regulate non-food production fertilizer. We, we just need to stop using so much fertilizer. Uh, everyone's fertilizing their grass. Grass doesn't feed us. It's just simply an aesthetic that we want to have. I've never fertilized grass, maybe put some some calcium on for the, the acid rain, but um, you, the, the grass clippings will fertilize a lawn and they can look robust without any fertilizer. So we're polluting our groundwater just so something looks nice in our front yard. It just, it makes no sense. Um, I guess the secondary policy would be um, looking at advanced treatment systems. So those areas that are not on sewage treatment collection system that just have septic tanks, um, <clears throat> that water that goes into your leach field is high in all kinds of things, PFAS, uh, microfibers, microplastics, and lots of nitrogen. And the traditional leach field really doesn't attenuate any, any nitrogen. So we need to be looking like what they're doing over on Long Island, they have called advanced treatment systems that will remove 60, 70, up uh, over 80% of the nitrogen because those leach fields are going right in the groundwater. They're out of the living system. There's no roots there to grab that and put it in the plant growth. It's just going right down into the aquifer. So if we could figure out a way that they can do this on Long Island and they have better soils for it, but if we could change policy in Connecticut to allow us to uh, put these systems in place where appropriate, I think it would go a long way to cleaning up our, our groundwater contamination. Yeah, I, I agree, Bill, and it's unfortunate we don't have the uh, enforcement and regulation in place to utilize that tool currently, which is, you know, uh, unfortunate because we have a lot of, of funds coming down to be able to, to possibly uh, help solve that problem. So um, I completely agree. And it looks like we have five minutes left for questions. Holly, was were there any questions in the chat that um, 
that you want to bring forward and we can bring to the panelists? <clears throat> yes, thanks for asking, Alicia. We have a number of questions. I'm trying to uh, get a few of them together. There were actually a number of folks interested in uh, learning more about regulatory programs uh, for, for managing salt, so winter treatment salt for roads, if one of the panelists would like to speak about that. Sure, I'm gonna I'm gonna put that one to you, Bill, because um, I know you you've worked on um, the the road salt legislation, which is in the um, had a public hearing in the Environment Committee. I believe that was Senate Bill 240. Is that correct? Yeah, I, is it 240? I can't remember. We're following a lot of bills right now, and feel free to jump jump into Alicia because you you did a good alert. You did a great alert on this, but road salt is a really tricky one. Um, because you have, you're balancing safety um, and with water quality issues. And I have a, a colleague, another uh, water keeper that's up at Lake George, and he has an award-winning program to reduce the amount of salt that's been being put on the roads because everything there goes right into Lake George. It's like a, a kettle. Um, and around here, the big issue, obviously, is they're using the different magnesium and different types of salts that they can track in drinking water wells. So people who have drinking water wells that are near where this, the salt applications are occurring, it's, it's eating away the, the, the casings of the wells, it's getting into the, the well water itself, it's, it's destroying the piping. Um, it's, it's a really big issue and we really need to look at uh, the science and technology to reduce reduce it as much as possible. I have a friend who's from Sweden. He says, oh, we don't use road salt, to rust the cars out. We just make everybody wear stud put studded snow tires on for the winter. Of course, that chews up the roads too. It's not an easy problem to solve. It's not, and, and the University of Connecticut, the Yukon Clear program has actually done quite a bit of, of um, research on this. And they're the ones that uh, helped to develop the Green Snow Pro program, which is promoted in, in the bill that's in the legislature now. And that's gonna help reduce excess salt um, uh, being put down to, to treat our roads in the winter. Um, Holly, is there another? Yes, oh, there are a number. Um, let me see if I can find one that will follow up well. So there are um, a number of questions and actually Bill spoke a little bit about um, managing lawns and um, the threats that those present to uh, drinking water, as well as other contamination like PFAS chemicals in uh, private wells in particular, if there's a uh, panelist who'd like to comment on how to protect our uh, private drinking wells and where we can get some testing. So maybe Melissa can help us with that as well. Yeah, I was thinking, Melissa, you, I know the, the um, uh, so the water conservation districts do a lot of education on this. So why don't you go ahead and take this one? And so a lot of what we do is visit residential properties who have concerns about you know erosion, soil erosion, water erosion, and how that affects underground storage tanks or septic tanks. And what we do is work with them to help divert the erosion elsewhere, or capture the runoff so that it doesn't harm their system. And um, we also recommend that they speak with the, the Department of Public Health or any other municipal staff to help um, tailor our recommendations to the local regulations so that we don't do anything that we're not allowed to do um, based on the municipal requirements. And there are a lot of educational pieces. I saw in the chat that someone was looking for things to share with their neighbors that um, we compiled as the conservation districts, if you want to check it out on our websites, and I'm sure the other host organizations have a lot of resources that they can share as well. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure I answered the question completely, but. <laughs> no, I, I think that was great. Um, um, so um, I don't, it's 1255 now, so I don't think we have time for any more questions. I'll check in with you, Karen. If you're talking, Karen. You may still be on mute. No, I'm. I'm here. <laughs> you know, okay. I think we're. I think we're running late, and I. I. I know we have the questions. We'll have if they have not been answered. I know the coast organizations are going to try 
to um, respond back to the people who've made them. But I think in order to hold to the hour limit that we have uh, told everyone we would do, I think um, uh, we're gonna have to end it right now. And I just can't say, maybe it's because I'm gonna talk to something, but I can't thank you all enough. It, uh, you know, uh, it was such an informative and such excellent presentation. There's so much to absorb and um, so much to do. And I would just personally like to very much thank all the speakers for all your time and your expertise. Um, if, the, if anyone uh, participating would like to learn more about the speakers, you can visit um, the World Water Day website. It's, I think it was in the, it was in the chat, ourwaterct.org. That uh, website will have not only the bios of all of the uh, presenters today, but information on the hosting and the supporting organizations. Give, it will give suggestions on what we can all do to help uh, protect groundwater. And it's got some fun facts about water and, and, and much more. Um, I would like to take this opportunity uh, to personally thank all of the members of the organ organizing committee for all their time and commitment to put this program together. And especially thank all of the people, all of the people in the audience and all the people who have participated. On just one final note, um, on the UN World Water Day tomorrow, we hope you will come and celebrate with us again. If you please come to the Capitol at 9 a.m., Capitol Steps, 9 a.m. tomorrow morning and help us once again celebrate uh, World Water Day by hearing from uh, legislators and advocates about uh, key uh, environmental and public health issues related to groundwater and hear about um, the discussion and hear what's going on the legislative discussion on key bills this session. Um, and finally, um, I would just like to say, we are blessed in Connecticut with wonderful water resources and ask everyone to please do all that you can to protect these sources of water um, for every resident now and in the future. And thank you all for participating today. Have a good day and thank you again.